For the desert tortoise to be taken off the endangered species list, populations must increase or remain stable for 25 years. Hey, baby tortoise, you're beginning an amazing life. The desert tortoise is the largest reptile in the Mojave Desert. Their lifespan is a bit like humans. Young are soft-shelled and vulnerable. Sexual maturity arrives around age 15. Males and females court. And the female digs a nest for the four to eight eggs, each about the size of a ping pong ball. The shell, called a carapace, has two layers, bone underneath, and on top, scoots made of keratin, like fingernails. Desert tortoises spend 90% of their time in underground burrows, which can be shallow or as long as 30 feet. There they hibernate in winter and stay cool in summer, when the burrow temperature may be 40 degrees cooler than the searing heat above. Desert tortoises can live to be over 50 years old. We're tapping him out with the hopes that uh, when he hears noise, he's gonna come charging out of the burrow. Right on cue. You ready? While deaths from upper respiratory tract disease triggered the endangered species listing, additional threats are multiplying. Ravens have become an increasingly deadly predator of young tortoises. The easiest place to find raven nests is underneath power towers. Yeah, they're back for a visit. Sticks blown off the nest. Oh. Here's a tortoise that's been eaten by a raven. It's a characteristic that they'll peck a hole in the top uh, to kill it. In northern forests such as Maine, ravens are still a wilderness bird. In the Mojave Desert, which has had uh, urban sprawl and, and uh, so many human modifications, uh, ravens are, have increased <clears throat> up to a thousand percent in the last 50 years. And the availability of food uh, has just caused this huge population increase. They're social birds and they congregate around landfills, around sewage ponds, around fast food restaurants, cattle yards, horse properties, anywhere where there's easy food. But the ones that have learned to uh, uh, eat juvenile tortoises, they can decimate a generation of tortoises right around the nest. So those ravens are targeted. And if they find evidence of a tortoise predation under a raven nest, then the Bureau of Land Management calls the Wildlife Services Department of the USDA and, and they come out and kill the raven. The power company comes out and knocks down the nest. They're just so adaptable. And then they teach the young uh, that tortoise is uh, good eating. So the next generation becomes a tortoise predator too. Desert tortoise recovery is enormously complicated because there is so much that scientists need to learn. For instance, just with the exotic non-native plants, what happens to tortoises who eat them? Or, if spraying herbicides is used to control the invasive plants and the tortoises eat them, what then? Well, we're studying the nutritional ecology of tortoises um, in relation to the wildfires that happened in 2005, but the, the pens are so armored to help keep the predators from eating them. About 25 of them are actually progeny from adults that were removed from this property when the housing development started to go in. Um, so we x-rayed those adult females, collected the eggs, incubated the eggs, and then raised them at the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center throughout the last six months. 
Today we were taking our first blood sample. Um, we have plans to take blood samples three times a year from all the animals that went into this project. And with the blood, we're going to study a variety of parameters, mostly parameters that would help us understand their meta metabolic fitness that would again relate to some of the various treatments and their diet. The nutrition study is asking primarily do tortoises on a native diet perform better, grow better, survive better than tortoises on an exotic, unnatural diet. So much about the life of the reclusive tortoise is a mystery that scientists are beginning to solve with 21st century technology. For example, a customized GPS logging system collects more data over the vast desert landscape than ever would be possible with field crews. One of the things we've been kind of on the leading edge of for a long time is trying to get some, some technology to help um, do a difficult job. You know, just the act of putting a, a radio transmitter on a tortoise means that we've got to have people out there on a monthly or, or sometimes weekly basis uh, monitoring tortoise activity to get data on how they're using habitat and what kinds of body temperatures they're achieving. We've got a company to help us miniaturize GPSs and actually now we have GPS loggers that are actually as small as the radio transmitter we were using 10 years ago. And now it has a radio transmitter and a GPS and a data logger all in the same package. And so we're pretty happy about kind of being able to work with technology companies to get to get the kinds of things that you have in your cell phone uh, working for us on tortoises to help us understand how they're, how they're using habitat. The GPS logger can follow and monitor the tortoise all day, every day, and everywhere it moves. So if I want to know, for example, uh, are tortoises using burned habitat or not uh, after wildfire, and, and I only get one picture of each tortoise a day, it takes me a lot longer to achieve the information than if I get detailed information about every day, how much time is that animal spending in or out of burned areas. And so we're getting all this now with, with people watching tortoises, but I think in the future, uh, we can get a lot more detailed information and be able to put a better picture together of, of what they're doing.